Josh, it's a pleasure to be with, here with you uh, today. Um, let me share my screen. Hopefully you can now see that. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Um, okay. So let's let's get started. Um, to, to start out, I don't think that climate change needs very much motivation right now. Um, and indeed, looking at the, the speaker series for, for this um, for this seminar, um, I see that many of the speakers, uh, especially in the, the past couple of weeks and in the next couple of weeks, will also be talking about um, uh, climate relevant topics. Um, but uh, from a from a very high level, uh, we're seeing increasingly the effects of climate change. They're getting more numerous. They're getting more severe. Um, everything from extreme heat to flooding to fires to outbreaks of uh, pests and disease. Um, and it's important to remember that climate change has a disproportionate impact also on already disadvantaged communities often and serves to exacerbate existing inequities within society and across the world. But climate change is not an on-off switch, uh, despite the fact that it is getting increasingly worse um, and we are already seeing people die as a result of climate change and many more will die regardless of what we do. Still, we have control over just how bad it gets. Um, and realizing that, that there we have a choice now between really terrible effects from climate change and absolutely catastrophically terrible effects from climate change um, means that we should be taking what actions we can. Um, now, we need net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, according to the UN's uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, and we're very far from achieving that. Greenhouse gas emissions continue to increase year after year, uh, very far from decreasing to, to zero. Um, there are two kinds of actions that are needed in climate change, broadly speaking. One is mitigation, which is reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and the other is adaptation, resilience to the consequences of climate change. Uh, climate science refers to understanding climate change, which is uh, sometimes sometimes seen as, uh, as part of adaptation. Um, Okay, so why why is this relevant to um, to this to the seminar? Uh, why is it relevant to machine learning, which is what I, I work on? Um, I will give a, a a really high level overview, which follows the the organization of a paper that a number of us put out several years ago. Um, called Tackling Climate Change with Machine Learning. This was designed to be an overview of many different ways that machine learning can be relevant in climate action uh, through deep dives into the ways in which machine learning intersects with problems in electricity systems, buildings, transportation, uh, forestry, agriculture, other land use, climate modeling, and many other areas. And I'm not going to be able to go through all of these many, many applications in this talk, um, but I encourage you to check out the full paper if you are interested. At a high level though, um, we see many different themes for how machine learning can be relevant in climate action. First, in improving operational efficiency, taking some complex automated system and uh, uh, controlling it uh, more efficiently so as to reduce, uh, reduce energy usage, uh, uh, carbon emissions or, or uh, waste. Um, and uh, some examples here include uh, optimizing the heating and cooling systems in buildings, either in uh, industrial or commercial HVAC systems, uh, large buildings that are controlled by some centralized heating and cooling system, or in, indeed in personal uh, homes where smart thermostats are increasingly using machine learning to control the temperature more effectively. Um, there are also many applications uh, of machine learning and operational efficiency within uh, heavy industry. So I want to particularly call out steel and cement manufacture, since those two um, industries together car, uh, account for between 10 and 15 percent of all global greenhouse gas emissions, which is quite significant. Um, in all of these cases, the, the common theme is there's some complex automated system. The system is already automated, so it's possible for an, for, for an automated controller to go in and often control the knobs in such a way that a human might not be able to work out like the really fine, fine grade and control that would be necessary to get as much, um, as, as much efficiency improvements. Um, the next theme that I want to touch on is gathering information. So oftentimes there are these big unstructured data sets like satellite imagery or uh, sometimes uh, large amounts of, of um, uh, text, textual corpora, 
that can that could be useful in informing decisions either in a in a in the context of governmental policy or in the context of private sector action um where it's really difficult to take the data and distill it into the information you need so for example we have satellite imagery and so we can see where buildings are in the world or where forests are but we can't really label all that imagery without automating the process so machine learning can step in and pinpoint where are forests being lost where uh, are there certain kinds of crops uh, to inform um, uh, food security initiatives? Um, where will uh, communities be at risk from coastal flooding um, and so on? And similarly, in the natural language processing context, uh, sometimes we can take large uh, bodies of text like corporate financial disclosures and pick out climate relevant information uh, in a scalable way that a human could do just would take a long time. Um, the third theme I want to touch on is forecasting. So oftentimes there's time series data and in a climate relevant context that could take the form, for example, of um, looking at the uh, electrical grid and saying, oh, well, we need to know how much power is going to be produced at each point in time and how much power will be consumed in order to make sure there's enough power available to meet demand. So now casting is a very short term forecasting of electricity supply is really important especially as we move to more um, solar and wind power, which are variable sources. So the amount available changes from moment to moment, knowing how much sun there will be or how much wind there will be and therefore how much power will be available is really important to make sure the grid is as optimized as possible and we aren't overproducing power or alternatively running the risk of blackouts where there's not enough power to meet demand. And similarly, predicting demand is really important. Um, as a, as a, an example closer to home, the UK's national grid has in, in, incorporated machine learning techniques actually into both electrical supply forecasting and demand forecasting. Demand forecasting, the latest um, deep learning method that they adopted, actually cut the error rate for demand forecasts in half. Um, speeding up simulations uh, is the fourth theme I want to mention. mention. Um, Oftentimes there are complicated physics-based simulations of different, different things in a climate relevant context. That could be climate models or, or weather models, um, understanding the earth's climate and weather. Um, and we, we understand these things very well, but that involves solving really massive uh, amounts of differential equations. Um, and we can do so only typically with, with supercomputers. And sometimes even, even then it takes months to run such simulations. Um, so taking these simulations and making them faster um, can be a, a really powerful role for machine learning. Oftentimes, this means taking a particular piece that's very slow and approximating that piece. Uh, so it's not as accurate as the physics, but it is much faster. Um, and similarly for, for grid planning models in the electricity domain. And then the final theme I want to touch on is accelerating scientific discoveries. So for example, uh, suggesting materials for use in batteries and perovskites. Um, uh, where the, the the bottleneck is that we need all these new materials for, for, for climate relevant technology. Storing renewable energy is really difficult right now. Um, so we need better batteries. We need better uh, electrocatalysts for creating fuels from electricity in certain cases. Um, we need certain, sometimes new materials to generate electricity for solar cells, perovskites, and, and, and um, to capture carbon potentially. Um, in, in uh, more speculative carbon capture and sequestration technologies, um, uh, design of new uh, carbon sorbents. So in all these cases, we need these new materials, but the process of iterating on a new material takes a really long time. And uh, there is a role for machine learning in speeding up the process, not, not, not replacing the process of, of, of scientific experimentation, but um, augmenting it by suggesting new materials that could be tried uh, profitably in a lab. Um, and so uh, reducing the number of, of physical experiments that need to be run. Um, before I get into examples from these various different areas from within my own group, I want to highlight some overall, overall themes going the other way, though. So we, we saw how machine learning can be relevant in all these different ways within climate action, but climate action can also be valuable from the perspective of machine learning innovation as well. Um, climate relevant problems offer many opportunities for developing cutting edge algorithms in machine learning and data science. And this is because there are many themes that we see in climate relevant problems where there are uh, key bottlenecks that haven't been addressed within the research literature either yet. Um, and climate relevant opportunities, climate relevant problems pose opportunities for, for uh, developing these methodologies. 
um, more broadly. So hybrid physical models, taking physics um, uh, physics con constraints or knowledge that we already have about a system and integrating that into a machine learning into a machine learning system, where oftentimes it, it's really difficult to build this kind of constraint-based knowledge into, into uh, especially deep learning systems, because they're typically just driven from data. But how we can integrate data-driven insights and known con symbolic constraints is really, is really valuable. Transfer learning and meta-learning, oftentimes there um, is a, a wide geographic distribution of data across, uh, across many different locations or across uh, different uh, times. There may be a temporal shift in the data. Um, notably, as the climate is changing, the data is changing. So there may be situations in which we need to shift from one data distribution to another. Transfer learning and meta-learning can be useful tools in such cases. Interpretable and causal machine learning. Many of these situations where we're applying algorithms, the output of the algorithms will be used in some context where the, the decision makers or people adopting the predictions or recommendations of a machine learning system need to know why they can trust it. And having interpretability about how the algorithm is working or ideally causality about what is leading to what decisions is really valuable. And similarly, uncertainty quantification can be extremely important in understanding how much a certain prediction from a machine learning system can be trusted. Um, oftentimes, uncertainty is really poorly calibrated in, in machine learning systems. And so having uh, appropriate measures of uncertainty is really valuable. And there are many other areas of cutting edge machine learning, um, which are informed by climate relevant problems. Of course, it's, it's worth remembering that we don't always need cutting edge machine learning. Um, and coming in as a computer scientist, I think it's really important to continually remind myself and those in my lab that simple methods are often, often completely sufficient. One shouldn't go in with transformers if linear regression or random forests will do the trick, and sometimes they do. Um, so what we do is we pick problems that we suspect will need innovation, but then we still try the simplest approaches because sometimes the simplest approaches are actually completely sufficient. Always first try simple baselines. So some considerations in thinking about the, the field of, of machine learning applied to climate action. Uh, first of all, machine learning is not a silver bullet. It's not magically going to solve climate change, unfortunately. There really is no silver bullet in, in terms of climate change. And if there, if there were, it wouldn't be machine learning. Machine learning is only one of many tools that we need. And even where it is relevant, it's only one piece of the puzzle. It needs to be integrated with insights from other domains in order to have any impact whatsoever. One's not going to just throw an algorithm at a problem without knowing anything about that problem or building in any kind of prior knowledge about that problem. It's also worth, re worth remembering that the high impact applications of machine learning are not necessarily the ones that are most flashy within either popular culture or even the machine learning space. So something like autonomous driving is very uh, um, sexy from a research perspective and from an industry perspective, but is um, actually probably counterproductive when it comes to climate change, uh, as we'll get to later. Uh, something like predictive maintenance doesn't get very much press, but it actually is extremely impactful. So finding failures or maintenance needs, for example, in railroads, um, that's something that is being done uh, within the industry, for example, by the German railway operator Deutsche Bahn. But even in the transportation space, self-driving cars get a lot more press. So really thinking critically about where the low-hanging fruit is, and is that the stuff that necessarily is getting talked about? Sometimes it isn't. Interdisciplinary collaboration is fundamental to work in this area, really as, as in every area of applied machine learning. Um, but it's, it's, it's important to think about this being relevant at every stage of the pipeline. So at, s at the stage of scoping the right problems, if you work on a problem that is not actually relevant to stakeholders down the road, that's really problematic. You, you have missed out on impact if you aren't solving the problem that people actually need to be solved. Um, you also need to think about interdisciplinary collaboration at the stage of incorporating relevant information. You're shooting yourself in the foot if you don't build in what stakeholders know about the problem and how to solve it. And sometimes working on integrating that information into your algorithms can be the most valuable and indeed the most challenging aspect of working in this space. And this is what we find within our, 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 my own group, that oftentimes the biggest challenges come from thinking about, oh, there's this domain information. How do we actually include it in our algorithmic approach? Um, the, the next uh, theme that I want to, uh, sorry, the, 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 next, um, the, the, the next reason why one wants to bring in interdisciplinary collaborator, collaboration is 
in shaping pathways to impact, perhaps most obviously, um, thinking about how your, your work is not just going to get a publication, but actually get used within the real world. Um, and this needs to be thought about from the start, because oftentimes the, the kinds of considerations which will be relevant for an algorithm being adopted or not need to be need to be built in right from the start of development, whether that is you know uncertainty quantification or robustness in certain ways. Um, robustness might mean a different thing depending upon the domain of application. Um, so really thinking carefully about what is needed by by end users and stakeholders who will be affected uh, by by the the, the the algorithm in question. And then finally, I want to touch on equity considerations. There are many ways in which equity intersects with the with, with, the, with the field of machine learning applied to climate change. Um, and um, this also ties in with broader questions of climate equity and climate justice, which are lenses through which to consider climate action um, as it relates to uh, existing structures of, of equity, inequity, and oppression uh, throughout society. Um, and this also relates to the uh, set of stakeholders who are empowered to work on problems in machine learning and in climate change. And certainly in machine learning, speaking as a computer scientist, the, the set of stakeholders empowered to work on machine learning who have the funding, the uh, computational tools and the visibility to work uh, to work uh, with 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 um, with impact within the space is very limited. Um, and this is a a fundamental problem in every way, from an equity perspective, from an impact perspective, from a perspective of thinking about what kinds of problems are prioritized. So for example, um, there is a lot of discussion within, within the field about um, machine learning's use in uh, fighting wildfires, which is a very, very important problem. Um, where there's a lot of great work being done, but there's much less work being done, say, on machine learning for fighting melting glaciers or locust outbreaks, both of which are huge problems also exacerbated by climate change, but they don't affect the same regions necessarily. So wildfires primarily affect uh, Europe, uh, North America, and Australia, while uh, locust outbreaks might affect East Africa, um, the Middle East, uh, South and Southeast Asia. Um, which are not necessarily places with as much um, uh, clout within the machine learning research community or as much VC funding. Um, and then finally, ensuring data is representative, because sometimes we have data inequities where the, the data used to um, work on a problem comes specifically from certain geographies or certain communities within a given geography. And that means that the algorithms developed using that data may be somewhat insidiously uh, tailored to those particular contexts and not as able to generalize within, within a global or multi-community context. Okay, with all those considerations in mind, I want to go back to this slide of lots of lots of different themes for machine learning and climate action and go through some applications within each particular each particular uh, theme here from with it, excuse me, within my own group. Um, um, okay, so let, let's first touch on improving operational efficiency. Um, and the problem I want to I want to talk about here is uh, balancing the electrical grid. Um, ensuring that there is enough power available at each point to meet the demand for, for power. Um, and from a computational point of view, this requires solving a non-convex optimization problem, which looks like this. It is quadratic, but it is non-convex. So the, 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 both the constraints and the objective function actually are, are non-convex, uh, sorry, are, are, are quadratic functions. Um, this is called AC optimal power flow. And because it's a non-convex optimization problem, which is sort of uh, well known to be a hard thing to solve in general, uh, exact solutions take a really long time. So typically what grid operators do is they simplify this problem. They actually linearize it. Um, and linearizing a non-convex optimization problem means that you get, get some answers that are sort of right, but are very far away from the optimum. Um, and this simple version, this wastes large amounts of power. Um, you are not finding the minimum amount of power that you need to produce at each generator in order to meet demand, and you're actually producing a lot of surplus power that gets wasted. It's more complicated than that, but basically that's what's going on. Um, and it's actually particularly a problem with solar and wind because you need to keep on solving this non-convex optimization problem many times if the amount of power available uh, is changing as it is with solar and wind. So how do we how do we reduce these these uh, these this wasted electricity? Well, typical deep learning fails um, 
uh, what you might imagine doing with typical deep learning is just using a uh, soft penalty for constraint violation and then optimizing this objective function. So like minimize this thing subject to don't violate the constraints too much. And so your loss is a mixture of this objective function and violation of the constraints. The problem is that if you violate the constraints a little bit, that's bad too. The grid actually breaks. You get a blackout and people die in practice. So nobody would ever want to use an algorithm that could have even slight infeasibility with respect to these constraints. And so what, what we did is we developed methods that can approximately solve non-convex optimization problems while also satisfying hard constraints. And this is work jointly led with Priya Donti, who I think is also going to talk um, maybe next week in, in, the, in this seminar, though actually I, I think that she's talking about other stuff, which is why I was talking about it today. Um, so let's go into what we were doing here. Um, uh, the, the problem that we're trying to solve from a deep learning perspective is we're trying to get an approximate mapping from X to Y, um, which satisfies uh, these constraints uh, and minimizes approximately this objective function. So we have parameterized our objective function and our constraints by X. We have this family of optimization problems, and we're trying to go from the parameters of the optimization problem to the optimum. Okay, we have inequality and equality constraints, and we're going to try to satisfy both of these families of constraints. How do we do that? Well, we're going to take as input our parameters x of this optimization problem, and we're going to throw that into a neural network. So far, so good. And then we're going to actually not output the full solution uh, y. We're going to output only certain variables within that solution. We're going to then complete all the other variables using the equality constraints, correct the whole thing so it satisfies the inequality constraints, and then train the entire thing end to end using a soft loss. Let's go through each component of this in turn. So first, we're going to output only some of the variables. So why do we do this? Well, if you think about uh, an optimization problem with equality constraints, you haven't got all the possible degrees of freedom that you might think you do, because you have these equality constraints. And so if you, if you have five equality constraints, then that means that five of your variables are determined by all of the others. And so if you leave out those five variables, you can actually solve for them. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to output a subset of the variables and then solve for the remaining ones using the, the equality constraints. Now, there's a, there's a problem here, which is how do you actually solve for those things? There isn't a nice closed firm way to solve um, using, using equality constraints. But there are numerical ways to do so. And if we use numerical methods like Newton's method to solve for the, for the other variables, we actually can, that's all we need in the end. Um, even though we're using a deep learning algorithm that is trained end to end, we can back propagate uh, by differentiating implicitly through these constraints. We can use the implicit function theorem to get derivatives of all of these things with respect to these things because we know what constraints have to be satisfied. And so using the implicit function theorem, we can calculate all the derivatives we need going backwards. That was very fast. If you haven't worked with such tools, don't worry if you're not getting it. And then the, the next step, so we've satisfied the equality constraints by construction. Now we're going to satisfy the inequality constraints. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to do gradient descent. Now it's not gradient descent on the neural network. It's gradient descent on the solution. We're going to take our solution and we're going to move it closer to satisfying the inequality constraints. And we can do this because the inequality, you can think of the equality constraints as being this green manifold, and you have to stay on the green manifold exactly. But the blue constraint, the blue inequality constraints, they just define some, some shape within that green manifold. And as long as you're somewhere within the boundaries of this blue shape, it's fine. You don't have to be exactly on anything. Like, you have to be exactly on the green manifold. And so in, in practice, in a few steps, you get to within this blue shape because you've, you've moved to satisfy the inequality constraints. And what we do is we, we take steps along the equality constraints manifold while uh, pre preserving those equality constraints um, while moving closer to, the, to, to satisfying the inequality constraints. And in practice, it just takes a few steps. OK, so now we have satisfied the inequality and the equality constraints. And we're going to train the entire thing. Um, this is a neural network. And then these two procedures, which are sort of hard coded in, we're going to train the whole thing end to end using this function. And this function is just minimizing your objective function. And then as a little trick to, to help it train, just minimizing deviations from the equality and uh, uh, the inequality and equality constraints. In practice, these become zero very fast. OK, so that is our approach. Let's see how it works, how well it, how well it solves different things. Um, we tested it on convex quadratic program. Um, so that's sort of the classical program that you could just solve using a, a standard um, convex QP optimizer. Um, we tested it on simple non-convex version of this problem. So 
Here, you have good algorithms, traditional algorithms to, to solve it. But if you make the problem non-convex, then all those algorithms break. And we find that our algorithm works well for both of these cases, um, either if it's convex or if it's non-convex. But then the, the problem that really motivated our work is thinking about AC optimal power flow. So let's dive into the results here. Um, and then here we compare against various other approaches. We compare against a traditional neural network trained with just a soft loss. So don't violate the constraints too much. But in actuality, that's not good enough. You end up violating the constraints a lot. Um, similarly, if you train using supervised learning and you just say, oh, here are a bunch of points, which here are a bunch of solutions from past solves of this optimization problem. Can you generalize to a new one? So it's, here, you're not optimizing for the objective function directly. You're just trying to uh, repeat the patterns that you've seen in your past supervised training data. And um, here, that, that fails too. It also violates the constraints significantly. Um, this is the case even if you use our, our, our special uh, correction procedure to correct for violations of the inequality constraints. And then here we just, we just use various ablations of our method showing that all the different parts of the method are necessary in practice. But the thing you wanna, you wanna look at is comparison against this, between this top row and the second row. So we are as good as the classical optimizer, which was deliberately designed to be specifically used on this one problem. We are as good with just a 0.22% a optimality gap, just very slightly off of the absolute optimum. And yet we are 10 times faster. And this actually is a conservative estimate. In practice, we're more like 100 times faster because you can parallelize on a GPU. And the bigger the, the problem, the faster, the, the bigger the improvement that you get. This is assuming no GPU parallelization. But um, deep learning methods are sort of very easy to parallelize. OK, so that is the first example I want to touch on. Let's go to the next couple. So here I'm going to touch on a method that, that um, really is relevant to both of these themes. Um, um, just in the interest of time, can't go into more information. We do actually do a lot of work on this gathering information piece, which I, I can't talk about, like biodiversity monitoring. We have sensor systems that automatically uh, detect and identify uh, insects, for example. We also integrate remote sensing data with on the ground uh, observations of animals, but can't go into all of that. Um, I will instead talk about remote sensing for agriculture, which is relevant to both um, in, in, several, in several different uh, problem settings. So um, understanding agricultural yield better is essential to averting food insecurity under climate change. And that's because climate change is causing uh, more extreme uh, weather events um, and um, resulting in crop losses across the world. Um, however, it is really difficult to get a sense of how this is happening because agricultural data are sparse and imbalanced across crops and locations. So you'd really like to be able to have some automated data gathering systems in order to understand how crops are doing in different parts of the world. But having the data to develop those algorithms is really challenging. Um, if you look at these data points, you can see that blue points are, are just, do we know, is there a crop there or not? That's a very sort of minimal, minimal amount of agricultural information. And you see there, we don't have the entire world. We do have a lot of the world, but the, the, really, the really high value information is the orange points, which are what kind of crop is it? And there we have very little information from around the world. I mean, there's some points you can't see, but basically it's, it's extremely geographically imbalanced. So how can we, how can we make do with this data, uh, which is state-of-the-art data from NASA, our partners at, at NASA Harvest? So how do we make use of this data? Um, well, we're going to develop meta-learning algorithms for remote sensing that can generalize well across different locations, um, specifically designed for labeling crops and predicting yield, though it'll turn out that they're actually useful in many other applications as well. Um, so, so, so what is, uh, oh, oh, sorry, I should, I should say, this is uh, work um, led by my student, Gabby Tseng, uh, and again, in collaboration with, with uh, NASA Harvest, in particular, uh, Professor Hannah Kerner. Um, so let, let's uh, give some background on meta-learning, what this is, uh, for those who haven't seen this before. So meta-learning refers to learning in such a way that a model can quickly adapt to a new task with new data. And you may have seen, in particular, the MAML framework, model agnostic meta learning. It's a popular framework in which a neural network is trained specifically to maximize the effectiveness of gradient updates on new tasks. So instead of optimizing for your, your, your standard objective function of, of reducing the loss, you are instead optimizing for an objective function, which is if I were to take a new update 
a new, a new grade, make a new gradient update on a new task, would I get to a setting of the parameters which was good for that task? So suppose that I am at this point in parameter space for my neural network. I could take a gradient update with data from data set one, and I could end up here, from data from data set two and end up here, and data from data set three and end up here. I want a place where all of these updates are pretty good. So I want to go to a place where if I were to see data set one, two, or three, I would be in a good position. And so I would be able to learn quickly any of these new data sets. And so that is what, Ma uh, what MAML is doing. It's saying, take this step here, which puts you in a place where you can adapt quickly to any of these new data sets. OK, so this is a training paradigm. It can run across different neural network architectures and across different task sets. How do we make this better? Well. Task-informed meta learning um, is a is the framework that we add to any meta learning framework, in particular to Mammal. And the goal is to build in additional information that Mammal doesn't have. In many situations in meta learning, we have access to metadata, and in the case of agricultural data, that could be, for example, where in the world is this data point? So if you're trying to generalize to new locations in the world, you need to know where your old locations were. You also need to know like what the crop type is. Traditional meta learning algorithms, in particular MAML, does not actually take this into account. You can't. You, you're, you, it's agnostic as to sort of the identity of the individual tasks, and this is part of the overall overall framing of deep learning. Often is let's just learn everything from the data, but oftentimes you have this information. You can add it to your algorithm. You don't need to learn it from the data. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take this metadata, where in the world is our data point, and what crop type are we trying to pick out? And we're going to encode it in some fashion. We're going to take this task encoder, throw that, throw that information into a task encoder, and then we're going to modulate the internal representations in our meta learner using this kind of information. Um, and that will enable us to sort of factor in what tasks we're solving, in addition to the fact, you know, in addition to the data itself. In addition to like the satellite imagery, we're also feeding in where and what we're looking at. Now, the second component, which sort of goes hand in hand with this, is forgetfulness. Tasks that the model has memorized already, you, you have this problem with overfitting in, in neural networks, right? So if you're performing already very well on a particular task, you're just going to dynamically drop this from training in order to better enhance generalization in other regimes. And this is, again, because the data is so skewed or in certain geographies and, ta and, and crops, that sometimes you know you want to be able to you want to be able to um, focus on the ones that you haven't seen. And so, what does this look like? Mm. Oh, I guess I should say an example of, of what one of these tasks is. Is suppose you've seen a lot of different locations and crop type combinations. So maybe you've seen coffee in Brazil and maize in Kenya, but you've never seen coffee in Kenya or maize in Brazil. Um, can you generalize well to that new setting with really minimal additional data? Are you able to are you able to um, learn this new task because you've seen all these combinations of, of, of different previous tasks? And so what we find is that the task informed meta learning uh, framework just blows everything else out of the water. In particular, um, I want to highlight um, this is a case on all of these different tasks, but I want to highlight in particular um, the case of Brazil, which is. Um, a task where there's very, very little data. And um, the task informed meta learning framework is vastly better than, say, MAML here. It's like, <laughs> this is just so, so much better. You don't normally see this amount of improvement. Um, and that's because with very little data, there's no way for MAML to really be able to be able to, to to learn the new task, except if you build in that information and say, oh, well, I've actually seen some data from this region before. And so maybe it'll look similar to other data points from Brazil, or other data points with the same crop. And you can see this even better here if you take these other data sets and you reduce the amount of data that you're given. So here in Togo, um, this is the performance of the task informed meta learning, our approach. And you can see that even down to zero new data, so like zero shot learning, it is actually able to perform extremely well, whereas all the other algorithms break. So if you give it no new data, it is still able to generalize pretty well because it knows what the task is. Um, so that was a, a classification task. This is now going to be a regression task, and it also performs very well. So 
in adding the task-informed meta-learning framework improves upon both LSTM and CNN architectures for this regression task, where we're trying to regress the amount of crop yield at a particular time based upon satellite imagery. And so understanding what crops are where and what the yield is going to be for crops is really valuable in, in agricultural adaptation to the effects of climate change. I should note, in both of these examples that I've given that um, uh, constrained optimization task and in this in this task informed meta learning um, uh, problem, these algorithms that we're developing are useful across many different settings. So here, for example, we've we were using task informed meta learning also in optimizing the amount of, uh, of energy uh, used in heating and cooling buildings. So optimizing building HVAC systems and also in carbon flux measurements. And there are just so many different settings in which task informed meta learning turns out to be useful even outside of the agricultural domain, because there are many situations where we want to generalize to a new task and incorporate metadata on the identity of the tasks in question. Okay, so let me, let me move on to the next example. So how much time do I have here? Um, I'm sorry, one moment. Um, okay, great. Um, my apologies. Um, give me one moment here. You have 20 minutes. Yeah, great. Um, sorry, just one moment. I got a bug in my slides. Um, okay, here we go. Um, so the the next example that I want to touch on uh, really quickly is in speeding up simulation. So um, the the motivation here is that, as I mentioned, Climate models can be really slow to run when they're based upon um, domain knowledge of the physics. The, the, those physics-based models are extremely accurate, but they can often take a very long time to run. Um, and so it would be very valuable if we could have fast approximations to certain pieces of these algorithms that could make them run much more scalably. And so one of the, the key bottlenecks in climate models is radiative transfer. This is a piece of climate models that determines basically how radiation passes through or is absorbed by layers in the atmosphere. A rough schematic is this. This is showing basically why climate change is happening. So radiation comes in from the sun. Some of it goes through the atmosphere. Some of it gets reflected back. Um, all the stuff that goes through, it, get, uh, it can get absorbed um, by the surface and then re-emitted in a different frequency. So you can have uh, visible light, for example, getting absorbed by the, by the land and then re-emitted as uh, IR. Um, so some of that IR, um, then uh, infrared gets um, absorbed by the atmosphere and sort of stays within the atmosphere, where some goes back out to, to space. Um, and you can see, if you add up these numbers, that the amount of radiation going in from the sun is 340, um, that is uh, watts per square meter, and then the amount of uh, radiation coming out is 100 watts per square meter reflected immediately, and then 239 uh, re-emitted um, from the surface that doesn't already get blocked by the atmosphere. And so total, this is 339 instead of 340. There's an imbalance there. And that is why climate change is happening, basically. Um, because not all the all, not all the, the the energy getting sent into the to the to the earth is getting re-emitted out. Um, but the various different pieces of what's getting absorbed and re-emitted is really complicated. And that's what radio transfer is. So it's time intensive to compute this with exact physics. But um, and, and, and the problems with it being so time intensive means that climate models have to be run at higher resolution. Uh, so, sorry, um, uh, sorry, I should say that's such a really lower resolution. Apologies. They run at coarser, coarser uh, granularity. You often see the climate models are run at like scales of grid scales of hundreds of kilometers. You have a grid covering the whole Earth, but it's a very, very coarse grid, um, just because it's so computationally intensive to run. Now, if we want to have finer grained and more, more accurate and more local um, climate models, we need to have uh, finer level predictions. Um, and being able to uh, run radiative transfer more quickly would enable us to do so. So we're using deep learning to rapidly approximate radiative transfer calculations, um, which are traditionally done using, using known physics. This is work led by my students, Zavo Khilin Kachai, who I believe spoke at the seminar a couple of years ago on something different, and Venkatesh Ramesh. 
So um, what we're doing here, and I'm going to go through it really quickly because of time constraints, is we're actually producing both an algorithm and a new data set. Um, and this is a theme that you know, I think is really valuable in this space. Oftentimes, the data sets don't already exist. You need to go out and work with the relevant domain experts and stakeholders to get the data that is that is relevant for solving the problem. But then sometimes you can externalize that work and produce a data set that is of value to the machine learning community in addition to valuable to the relevant stakeholders. So this is what we did here. We um, took the Canadian Earth System model, um, created a data set with 10 million data points. Um, importantly, this includes various out of distribution tasks. So whether the, the uh, understanding whether your models um, can generalize to different climatic conditions, to pre-industrial conditions, so before we were throwing all these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, to future conditions, and also to the weird anomalies of volcanic eruptions, which throw lots of new gases into the atmosphere. Um, so we had we had all these different OOD test sets, um, and then we um, the, the task itself was trying to predict the up and down welling flux. So this is and the, and the heating rates. These are some variables associated with uh, how much how much energy is getting absorbed or re-emitted at different layers of the atmosphere. Um, and the input is taking gas concentration, temperature, pressure, humidity, et cetera, at different, different properties at layers of the atmosphere. So you've got like this, this 1D input, layers of the atmosphere, what's the value of all these things at the layers of the atmosphere? And then whether you can predict these other values, like the, the flux and the heating rates. And we looked at this from lots of different deep learning models, fully connected networks, um, one-dimensional CNNs, various graph networks, transformers. Um, and we also integrated, um, though I'm not going to talk about that here, we integrated various um, physics-based loss functions uh, into the networks. So trying to relate these different variables together because there's a known relationship between flux and heating rates. And we actually built that into the models to make them be able to, to generalize better. Um, and we found that the more structured models, the ones with the physics the physics-based loss functions and the, the structured convnets and graph networks, which like build in the structure of sort of what is connected to what within the atmosphere, allowed us to generalize much better in OOD situations. So all the models performed really well on the on the the, the, the data that they were trained on and in the in the testing data from, from that period. But if you look to the pre-industrial conditions or the future conditions, the more structured models like CNNs and graph nets performed much better. They had much, much lower error when it came to generalizing to, to new conditions. And so this is the takeaway that we have that you know, building in the structure of the domain is not surprisingly very useful in informing these models. And actually these models are performing so well that they're now, uh, we're now working to integrate them into the Canadian Earth System model um, as just a fast approximation that will enable, enable the model to run more swiftly. Um, okay, so I want to, I, I'm gonna skip over accelerating scientific discovery. We have some very new work that's out on this. Um, which I'm happy to talk about offline. That involves using graph neural networks to rapidly um, approximate the uh, properties uh, of electrocatalyst candidates. So trying to design better catalysts for renewable energy storage. And we're, we're working on fast graph networks that can uh, scalably model the uh, relaxation of, a, of, a, of a, a reactant chemical onto a, onto a catalyst and like how the dynamics work there, which is traditionally done using quantum chemistry. But I don't really have details. Uh, I don't really have time to, to go into the details there. Um, the... Um, final example that I want to touch on, though, sort of cuts across all of these themes, and it speaks to the need for building in domain knowledge in machine learning more broadly, which is the theme that I, I that we that we see across all of these different examples. How do you build domain knowledge into machine learning, uh, and why is this necessary? So let's look at an example where this was not done, and what happens. So machine learning continues to rely on many, many data sets that are not relevant to climate change specifically, uh, and are designed to be sort of broadly applicable or at least broadly um, uh, thematically relevant to many, to many different problems in machine learning. And one of these is ImageNet. In computer vision, ImageNet is still used a lot. Um, there are currently 32,000 citations just on ImageNet 1K, which is the 1,000 class version of ImageNet. And that's used both to evaluate different models. And you know, people are still doing research where getting an extra 0.1% improvement on ImageNet is seen as really good. And also in pre-training for real world tasks. So taking a model, pre-training on an ImageNet and then fine tuning it for whatever uh, uh, task is of interest. 
And these data sets were often generally created without very much domain knowledge. Um, in the case of ImageNet, this was created using uh, internet image search. Um, uh, you just you know, search for images with a certain word, see what comes out, and then annotate that without relevant experts in the room. In the case of ImageNet, this was done with uh, Mechanical Turk. So Google image search followed by Mechanical Turk labeling those images. Now, this is a problem in many levels. There are a lot of problems with ImageNet, and I'm not going to go through all of those. There are huge problems, uh, for example, in um, uh, misogyny within ImageNet, in sexualization of images, in biases in what is depicted within images. Um, but we're going to concentrate on one particular piece that hadn't been looked at before. Uh, it turns out that, um, I I'm sorry, there's somebody who hasn't muted in the audience. Would you be able to mute since there's some background noise coming in? Um, turns out that 27% of ImageNet is actually made up of images of wild animals. Um, and so we're going to work with ecologists to analyze these images. This is work with Sas Luch Sasha Luchoni. Um, and sorry, this is a, an incorrect, it's out of date citation. This was uh, now published at AAAI. Um, so the, um, the first thing that we see when we, when we analyze the, the images in ImageNet is th they're just wrong. Uh, turns out that 12% of the images in ImageNet that refer to wild animals are incorrect. Um, and remember, this is 12% of 27% of ImageNet. So it's a lot. Um, when we're talking about like tiny little improvements on ImageNet and a large number of the images are not right. So some of the, some of the classes, the categories in ImageNet are over 90% wrong. Things like rock crab or kit fox, goldfinch, Weirdly enough, these images are wrong. Um, and this is, it, it, it's, it's problematic in many ways. Um, what it comes from is generally speaking, annotator and experience, not surprisingly. Um, these are um, classes that require uh, technical expertise to, to distinguish often. And um, the, um, the subtleties of, for example, difference between uh, a heron, which kind of bird, and a crane, which another kind of bird, are very, very difficult. But um, then there are also issues with nomenclature, which which turn up, like leaf beetle, um, where there are a lot of images that are classified as leaf beetle, but they're actually just other kinds of beetles on leaves. Leaf beetle turns out to be a technical term, which refers to a particular kind of beetle. And there are other image net classes, which are um, which are also beetles, but are not uh, the particular um, the particular uh, term leaf beetle. And so you have in, in both of these situations, you have um, images which should be in one ImageNet class and are actually labeled as another ImageNet class. They're not just wrong; they are they should be in another class that actually exists within ImageNet. Um, we find that 12% of the classes conflict with other classes. So for example, um, Tusker and African Elephant are two ImageNet uh, classes where um, Tusker is actually, it refers to elephants with large tusks. So it's basically anything that's in this class is also going to be in this class. Um, Meerkat and Mongoose, where Meerkat is a kind of mongoose. So anything that's in this class, again, is going to be automatically in this class. So it's huge ambiguity. And then we have 11% uh, of classes that are vague or unclear, where cricket or kite, for example, refer to um, classes that um, uh, depend upon where you are geographically, what those, what those words mean. And then we find huge geographic bias also. So we find that about 60% of the images um, of birds specifically, which is a large fraction of ImageNet, show birds from the, the US, uh, even though the US represents actually only 8% of global bird diversity. And Europe is also overrepresented. So you can see, compare the, the true biodiversity in black of these various different uh, regions of the world to the, the representation in ImageNet. So the US is actually most represented, even though it's practically the least biodiverse area. Um, um, and this imbalance is true for the choice of classes. So for example, the bald eagle, which is the national bird of the US is a class. There are about 20 other countries that have eagles as their national bird, but none of those eagles make their way in. Mislabeled images, so for example, goldfinch, um, there are a lot of images 
uh, that are supposed to be the European goldfinch, but are actually the US goldfinch. 90% of the images of goldfinches are actually the US version rather than the European version, uh, even though that European version is, is supposed to be what's, what's there. And then the image is chosen to reflect non-specific classes, like there are 50 species of jays in the world, but almost all of them in the data set are this particular one, which is the blue jay, which is the one found in the US and Canada. Um, and so we find that these, these errors and biases are really, really systemic throughout ImageNet. And by understanding, uh, by, by, by going into the, the wildlife data, we can pick apart these problems in a very rigorous way. That's probably also the case in other parts of ImageNet, just not necessarily quite as measurable. Um, and this is a problem throughout, uh, throughout um, quickly go through that, but um, this is a problem throughout machine learning. It's, it's a problem because Accuracy on ImageNet and other, other machine learning data sets turns out not to be effective if we aren't building this domain expertise into making these data sets be accurate. It's a problem because the, the, the problems actually get harder when you have these kinds of errors and biases in your data. So for example, in the case of ImageNet, if your, if your classes in ImageNet are not, um, are not, um, are very skewed towards particular species, say species from the US, and it's actually secretly testing few and zero shot learning rather than rather than uh, what it's purporting to test, which is sort of balanced, fine-grained image classification. But then more broadly, it's talking about the it's speaking to the dangers of using ImageNet to develop machine learning models. People are using ImageNet data to often train or pre-train machine learning models for real-world tasks in biodiversity monitoring and in other contexts. And actually, particularly under-resourced researchers often use ImageNet in these ways. And more broadly, there are huge failures in machine learning data sets, uh, which are still often defined by a small set of institutions, a small set of people, and really not not um, created with the relevant application domains in mind. They're still often created sort of by and for CS people, even if they're then getting used in an applied context. Um, this is an example, by the way, of just weird ImageNet images. This is a wombat dressed in a human dress with butterfly wings. And there were a whole lot of images that were, that were like this, that were just confusing in ImageNet. So really, we need systemic change in machine learning best practices in the context of data create, data set creation and use. How much time do I have? Um, so there are still five minutes left. So I will I will wrap up. Yeah. Great. So to close, I just want to touch on how machine learning is not just a positive force with regard to climate action it can also negatively impact the climate. And there are several different ways in which this occurs. First is perhaps the one that gets the most press, which is computation. Machine learning, like other computing, has a, an energy impact because of the energy required to run computers. Um, and also because of the embodied emissions from hardware, the um, emissions required to make a computer to get that material out of the ground and to engineer it into the, the final form of the computer. Um, but there are other ways in which machine learning actually has an even more significant negative impact on the climate, which don't necessarily get talked about as much. Um, uh, those are the immediate impacts of applications. Machine learning is a multi-purpose technology, and it's being used in all these various different ways that I've talked about today to positively impact climate action, but also in ways that are directly run directly counter to climate action. Notably, machine learning is used in fossil fuel exploration and extraction very extensively. Um, it's, it's been estimated that the fossil fuel industry is going to make half a trillion dollars in additional profit, thanks to AI and advanced analytics, just by 2025. So that's a huge impact, which is basically being used to directly outcompete low carbon energy sources. Um, and there, there are many other ways in which machine learning is sort of directly being used in ways that run counter to climate action. But then more insidiously, even, there are systemic applications of, 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 of uh, systemic impacts of, of machine learning applications. There are machine learning enabled advertising systems. Um, most advertising now is run by machine learning, and that is specifically designed to increase consumption. There's been no real analysis of the effects that machine learning algorithms have on increasing the amount that people consume in terms of resources and energy. But that's it's sort of explicitly what such recommender systems are designed to do. And then there are many applications of technologies that where the, the impact 
and the climate related impacts depend upon how we use the technology. So in the case of autonomous driving, if we are building autonomous driving for self-driving personal vehicles, which is really what most, what most people in the space are focusing on, that is probably going to actually hurt the climate because it will cause people to drive more. Even if each mile driven becomes slightly more efficient, it's reducing the barrier to driving. So it's anticipated that people will drive significantly more as a result of self-driving cars. But if we work on self-driving buses and trucks, maybe that impact will become the will we'll turn to the sign of that impact will change and we'll have more of a positive effect on the climate. So overall, I think that the theme here that I want to that I want to uh, to end with is that the impacts of technology are not sort of inevitable. And the implicit choices that we make affect the impacts of our actions and our work, regardless of whether we think that we're working on climate action or, or more broadly on AI for good, we the lens of climate action, sustainability, AI for good is something that we should be thinking about with regard to all applications of machine learning. AI for good doesn't mean just adding new good applications of AI on top of business as usual. It means shaping all applications of AI to be better for society. And throughout applied data science, this really should be the theme. Think about how you can steer your work regardless of what you're working on to make it be better for society. Uh, to close, I want to end on um, just briefly mentioning some of the resources available at Climate Change AI. Uh, we're, uh, Climate Change AI is a, is a nonprofit organization of which I'm a co-founder and chair. Um, and actually the past two speakers, um, uh, that would be Ukasha and Sarah within the seminar. And then the next two speakers, uh, Malthias and uh, Priya are also part of Climate Change AI. Um, we work to uh, enable impactful work at the intersection of climate change and machine learning. Uh, via digital resources like that tackling climate change with machine learning report, but also reports aimed at policymakers and other audiences. Uh, we run conferences and other events. Our next workshop is at iClear in Kigali in just a, a month or two. Um, and you can look at past papers from our workshops and other events at this URL. We also have a summer school every year. Um, the virtual summer school is, I think, still open. I'm not sure um, um, for, for this year. Um, and then we also have funding programs. Uh, we have an innovation grants program that's already given away $2 million to impactful research at this intersection of climate change and machine learning. And we also run um, many um, knowledge sharing platforms. So we have webinars, we have happy hours. We have a newsletter that comes out monthly with information on jobs, data sets, papers, funding opportunities. Uh, if you're interested in this space from whatever position as a student, as a, as a more senior researcher, or as a practitioner, it's a great resource for finding out more. With that, I think we may have a couple of minutes for questions and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, um, David. Um, if someone in the audience uh, has a very good question, we can we we have we have time to answer it. Uh, you can either write it directly in the chat or just speak. Um, okay, I had a, a, a one question myself. Um, in the meantime, um, I thought maybe I could ask it. Um, so <clears throat> regarding your um examples um uh, of constrained deep learning for grid optimization or a remote sensing for agriculture, um, I was wondering, um, do you take into account the possibility that um, the context is going to change uh, in your modeling. So for example, for like um, crop yield prediction, the fact that climate change is going to affect um, the crop yield in some regions more than others, um, do you take that into account? Or for uh, grid optimization, the fact that maybe uh, due to climate change, um, electricity consumption is going to increase during winter. Um, so basically uh, your set of, of uh, constraint uh, is going to change? Um... It's a great question. It, it depends on the, on the particular framing of the problem. In the case of grid optimization, um, the AC optimal power flow problem that we're, that we're working with, we're given the demand. So it's not a question of really forecasting demand. Um, there are demand forecasting algorithms where people have to, to tackle such challenges of non-stationarity and the, the data is changing as a result of climate change. And it's a really good point. Um, this is definitely something that people struggle with in such contexts. Um, in the case of um, our agricultural remote sensing, um, 
that's not something that we addressed explicitly. Um, and it's definitely something to, to bear in mind. We aren't forecasting very far in the future. So it's not like we're trying to predict what's going to happen in many years. Um, we're trying to predict what's happening in the same growing season. So it's not necessarily, it's, it's possible that all the information we need is already captured there. And it's already within sort of the, 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 the it's more just changing what the, um, um, the set of data points, uh, the input data points is that we're getting in rather than changing the, the kind of dependence between the, the input and the output. All right, thank you. And we have one question from the audience. Um, has there been any intersection between machine learning and water desalination? It's a great question. Um, I don't know. Um, I'm ashamed to say. Um, I know that there is work on machine learning for um, water purification um, and optimization for, for water treatment facilities. I would point to the work of uh, Professor Martha White, um, among others, in that in that regard, um, and that sort of falls under the under the space of reinforcement learning for control and taking a control problem and just you know, optimizing optimizing the system as much as possible. But I don't know about specifically desalination. Uh, all right. So the audience, uh, the person is satisfied with answer. Um, they say thank you. Okay. Um, all right. Well, if there is no other question, um, I would like uh, on behalf of the audience also to thank you very much for this presentation. It was uh, very inform informative and um, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, thank you so much, everyone. Take care.